Hello everyone, this is Rajesh Isan Gupta and we are in the week 2 of our course and then we will be uh, as as we have sort of gotten into the discussion about the the simple weaving and then like I mean much more fairly complicated ones. So we'll continue our discussion on the on the brocade of Varnasi. So what happens in this case that I mean as as I have mentioned that I mean there are um, the silk threads as well as like I mean this gold or the metal wrapped th silk threads are used which is also called zari that we have already uh, sort of noted in the earlier lectures. So in this case what happens we see that I mean in some of the cases the zari is used as a base and on the top of that the motifs are created with uh, the silk threads and which sort of like I mean creates almost like a 3D effect and in which we can see that almost like a tactile quality that that if one like I mean sort of like I mean passes their uh, fingers through the fabric one can see the up and down and then like I mean this this slightly 3d quality that is achieved in this motifs those are also created and it is not just uh, about the technique but also like I mean this variation of the material that I mean one is just silk thread and the other is just um, the, the other one is like I mean metal wrapped silk thread or zari so the differences between them and that that sort of like I mean enables this kind of interplay. So this is this is also something we needs to uh, we need to take in account that how um, um, this this um, the diversity or like I mean all those intricacies that are achieved in this complicated weaving styles are not just about how it is woven, but it is also ingrained in the kind of materials which are used in it. Now the other thing that we find here in case of like I mean the brocade weaving is that there are certain terms and at least like I mean for the Varnasi brocade we find that there are many architectural terms which are used and if we pay close attention to the image that we have on screen even though it is pretty shiny for that reason that I mean the, the kind of like the horizontal and the vertical the crisscrossing is very hard to sort of like I mean uh, register but if you see that there are those parallel horizontal lines which sort of like I mean run across the entire piece of fabric and then there are also like I mean the vertical grids in some cases like I mean you know how we find that to be also dividing the entire space into this uh, grid like form a graph paper like form and in this what also happens that I mean we find that in many brocade weaving I mean of course in all brocade weaving we have that there needs to be a paper or like I mean a, an already made drawing or a piece of reference which needs to be followed when this weaving sort of like I mean takes place and since weaving is something that is constituted of like this vertical warp and then horizontal weft for that reason the drawing also needs to be conveyed through a form which would probably be sort of like I mean corresponding to this kind of like I mean these boxes. So if I am thinking in terms of a, a diagonal line like this that needs to be sort of imagined by how many boxes it will pass through. So this is something that we find that to be there for any motifs which would be created in the uh, brocade weaving or in any kind of extra weft weaving or like in the tapestry weaving. So this is something that remains at the heart of it that how the motifs are created or any kind of like I mean patterns that we find which are not just there for the arrangement of the warp or the web threads. So all the other patterns how they are created. Now for those reasons as I have already mentioned that I mean the, the, the draw uh, person like I mean who who is also called as a draw boy who would sit on an elevated level and would like I mean uh, sort of raise a set of like I mean this threads for inserting the web thread into it but so uh, that was also replaced by you know the punch cards and that, that that we find in the in the 19th century France and that is how this jacquard loom uh, technology was also brought in the Indian subcontinent and then we find that I mean how the jacquard loom uh, technique in which like instead of a person who's sitting there and sort of like I mean raising this set of threads 
punch cards are used for sort of like I mean passing those particular set of threads and those punch cards are also created keeping these reference drawings in mind in which the entire drawing is sort of divided into this in this uh, grid like format. So this a particular kind of grid like format that we find which remains at the heart of of course like any form of weaving that is the simple weave brocade weaving or whatever it is but also at the same time making all the kind of patterns which would appear on a on a brocade weaving on any kind of extra weft weaving so in this cases what we find here is that this jacquard loom technique that that sort of like I mean draws on the existing um, uh, technology of, of um, um, sort of like I mean uh, working on this silk weaving technique and then sort of like I mean makes it much more weaver friendly in certain ways uh, when, when um, this, this punch cards are um, um, introduced. But however, like I mean, even though today we find in many of the silk weaving centers, the sponge cards are extensively used. There are also places, for example, in Varnasi and and few other places in Gujarat and so on, and um, and of course, like I mean, and in the other few of the other pockets of of in in India as well, in the Deccan India and so on. So. Uh, in those cases we find that I mean still um, the the manual work in which like I mean a draw person would sit on the top of this uh, this elevated ground and then would uh, sort of like I mean raise this set of yarn for weaving is something that is continued. So with those things what we also find that I mean in this kind of weaving and not just this kind of weaving but like I mean in many other like all weaving there are certain architectural terms which are used in the weaving uh, styles. I mean I will start by discussing some of the terms that we find uh, in the um, uh, in the Varnasi uh, uh, brocades. So for example some of the names which would be like Jali, Ashrafi and, and um, so on like I mean some of them might also refer to like I mean um, the stars or the moons and so on and as, as I also have been documented by the Museum of Art and Photography in, in Bangalore we find that I mean this, this, this kind of terms are something that, that also refers to the architectural uh, uh, structures and if we can think about like I mean some of the architectural structures in the Mughal context and Jali is something that is made of stone which is there as a perforated stone structure which is used either as lattice window particular kind of viewing experience or this is also used for the warmer summer climate where air can pass through the structures much more uh, um, uninterruptedly. So this is this is something we find that there are certain architectural terms in, in brocade weaving as well as like I mean all different forms of weaving. and. Perhaps I will also extend that by saying that uh, there are um, uh, architectural terms in, in all sort of textiles we find. So now what does that signify like I mean do we do we think about like I mean this this things to be something that the architecture came first and that is how like I mean the textiles also sort of got influenced by it. So I use the term influence very uh, cautiously here because there can also be um, certain um, um, issues or problems with terms like influence because when we talk about influence and we, we find that I mean of course like I mean this 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 term and its its uh, significance has also been uh, addressed by Rebecca Brown and Deborah Hutton in terms of like I mean when we talk about influence it sort of signifies that there is a source from which like influence travels and then there are recipients who sort of receive this influence so there is already a kind of hierarchy that is set in this relationship. So for that reason what happens we cannot when we use the term influence we cannot really uh, see this thing as a transmission of knowledge between two stakeholders but we always try to understand that influence is a thing in which like there is a already inherent hierarchy and there is a point from which influence starts and then like there are recipients which receives the influence and then it sort of like I mean gets uh, modeled in further. Now 
what if we do not really think that there is a particular kind of influence but there is a conversation or the, there are like I mean transmission of knowledge if we think in these terms so then what happens so what we find in this case that there are um, in this case we can we can also kind of like I mean perhaps like I mean flip the question that if we see that there are certain uh, established architectural terms which are there in the textiles. Does that always have to mean that the textiles always receive these architectural terms or can it also be the other way? Can there be a possibility that these textiles actually existed before the architecture came into being and then like I mean somehow the terms which are used in the architecture were also used same way in textiles instead of like textiles borrowing the architectural terms can it be possible that these terms already existed and it's part of like a shared vocabulary and in from which like the architects also have received these terms and also the textile makers utilize these terms can it be a possibility so this is a particular question that we will be probably like i mean addressing little more with more examples now when we talk about brocade we should not think that I mean brocade is something that is just there reserved for silk and zari but it can also happen with cotton fabric and so this is actually an example of a fabric here it's a jamdani sari that we have from undivided Bengal and in this case what we find here is that there is the continuous warp the continuous weft and then on the top of the weft we have the extra weft which are usually inserted so for jamdani weaving for the this meticulous work that we have on screen we usually have that the needle or like i mean small tools which would like i mean hold the weft threads those will be inserted only like i mean with this meticulous calculation through this warp threads and then like i mean it is not something that is continuous so this is something we find in this jamdani weaving now the term jamdani people have also sort of argued that i mean how the term came into being of course it has its persian origin and jamdani sometimes it might mean that a flower vase and some people have also noted that i mean whether jamdani the word jam came from jama and dani means like some kind of a container which seem to be not making much sense however jamdani as a flower vase can also have its significance since we are looking at many of these motifs which are flowering or blossoming into the entire fabric so in this case what we find that the jamdani weaving which also comes very close to the brocade weaving was um, something that was preferred in terms of uh, many people who were not comfortable wearing silk so for example in a number of muslim societies we find that the direct use of silk was not encouraged and for that reason we find either things like the this kind of cotton fabric in which we have the it's not made of silk and of course like i mean for silk there are issues around that i mean whether the silk worms are killed or not and perhaps like i mean these issues which are associated with um, uh, violence is something that that remains as a determining fact for many religious sects for either using or not using silk so in this case what we find that i mean if um, um, the the kind of material is something that was uh, prioritized for for uh, making particular kind of um, this this uh, fabric which would be used by either a particular community or it can also be suited for particular regions such as uh, in eastern india in bengal for the climatic condition and everything cotton is something that has been understood as the most suited um, uh, um, fiber and that is the reason we find that this kind of incredible uh, uh, diversity of motifs or experiments have been done on cotton now the other place where we also find a similar kind of jamdani technique that was um, um, practiced is in that is in tanda in uttar pradesh in which we find that again this extra weft is inserted however instead of like i mean having the extra weft with a uh, different color in tanda we find usually like i mean the the all the weft and the warp to be in the same color 
usually white or unbleached cotton for that reason there is always this white on white um, kind of motifs the set of motifs which are which we find in this this kind of fabric for jamdani weaving the other thing that we find usually is that the warp and the weft would also be if we are using like i mean super fine um, uh, cotton like 120 count cotton or 100 count cotton then the warp and the weft can be one 100 or 120 count cotton but then the extra weft that is inserted on uh, in for making the motifs are usually much thicker compared to the regular weft and that is how we find these motifs wherever these motifs are created they are usually much more sort of like i mean uh, much more stable or like i mean at the same time a bit stiff compared to the body of the fabric or the cloth So with all these discussions that we have and already as I have mentioned that I mean there are some of the issues we see around how these aspects of the architecture, textile, all of them they sort of like I mean whether they come together or not and then when we see certain aspects around like how what kind of materials are used. If we think about the brocade weaving in which the zari threads are used as base and then like if the silk the plain silk thread is used for making the motif then like i mean this kind of this light 3d effect that it sort of like i mean creates is something that also sort of makes us think about the structure of it and then like i mean how the material uh, combination with the particular kind of technique can lead us towards particular results and the same thing we can think about in terms of the jamdani saris in which if there are a particular thread count is maintained for the warp and the weft threads and then we have the extra weft which would be much more thicker so it adds to the stability of the textile in a different way so all these minute things about the stability of the textile the durability the appearance and everything else that make us think that the motifs which we have on the on this um, you know on this fabrics the saris whatever they are they are not something that is disconnected from the structure of it so the structure and ornamentation are not something disconnected again it might go back to like i mean some of the primary concerns we had that how technology or like i mean this this techniques of doing this um, this this weaving is something that is not disconnected from its intellectual aspects now when we think about textiles and its correlation with architecture and and artifacts then then we also might have to go back to some of the uh, art historical theories that i mean how they have uh, shaped this this uh, concepts and also like i mean how they paved the ways for us to sort of comprehend these issues in new light so one of the aspects that sort of like I mean came up and that that started with the very warp and the weft that I mean how there are horizontal like I mean horizontal weft and then like the vertical warp and then the the combination of them it sort of like I mean gives textile the required or the needed stability now if we think about that that I mean what kind of warp I mean what kind of horizontal and vertical um, 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 components are there in an architecture we can think about it the the most simple form of architecture in which there can be a pillar and a bar and which would sort of like i mean give the basic of many i mean all architectural form that i mean something that is vertical and something that is horizontal and that is how like i mean the bars would support the roof and that is how the enclosure can be made and then without a pillar without this raising like i mean a raised surface like i mean it cannot have an enclosed space which is the basis of any architecture i mean well like i mean not an enclosed space for as such but like i mean a space which can accommodate people within it so if there is no raised area then it cannot really accommodate anyone within it so those those things what we find here that this particular concerns that sort of like i mean came up in many of the theories but perhaps like one of the most 
uh, important uh, art historical theories that that sort of addressed this this correlation between uh, architecture and textile that came from German art historian Gottfried Semper in the uh, mid 19th century and and Gottfried Zemper was someone who had sort of like I mean worked on mostly the ancient structures so we find a lot of his work sort of concerned um, the, the Greek structures and then how like I mean the, the Greek structures and the Assyrian structures would be there and his interest in the Assyrian uh, and the Mesopotamian uh, structures we find that I mean that was that was sort of like I mean uh, spearheaded by his interest in domestic spaces so a lot of times he had argued that how uh, the, the primary structures that we find from the ancient times and um, if we are talking about India if we are talking about Egypt a lot of them we would find them to be associated with religion and whereas like I mean he was someone who was also interested highly interested in the domestic spaces and for that reason we find the Syrian the Mesopotamian um, structures in which like I mean the palace complexes and so on are, are found at least in the ruins so those are the ones we would find that I mean Zemper was highly interested in and why he was interested in this kind of structures is because that he thought that I mean the structure this architectural structures and the decorations that sort of like appeared on the structures perhaps in form of the panel or the bust relief and so on so those things are not something to be um, thought about separately so he actually thought something that decorations are actually the architecture's organic life it's not something that the decorations are added on the top of the architecture but if we at least according to Zemper he was also someone who had extensively reconstructed a number of this architectural structures um, I mean like the reconstructed drawings he did and with the Greek structures and so on and we find in his reconstruction a lot of colors are used perhaps it was also an indication for going with the decorations and not just thinking as like the structure is the thing that is the most important part so what Zemper in this case was suggesting was that how the decorations that we find there on any of the structures if we study them closely if we understand them closely that might reveal something about the structure itself so it's not really like the structure or the form is um, sort of like influencing the decorations but it's perhaps sometimes the opposite of it that if we start from the decorations we might understand the structure in a new light and this is something that was understood by Zemper and perhaps th this is this is a question that that we still sort of like I mean you know argue about and um, in this case what happens is that uh, he he understood that a form an architectural form can only be understood when the like I mean can only be fully understood when the decorations are taken in account and with that thing what we also see that I mean he would sort of like I mean extend his um, um, understanding of what he meant by ornamentation and decoration to a lot of uh, textiles and like I mean decorative items that we have here and what he would say that I mean in, in terms of like I mean the foundation for the architectural spaces there are four aspects he had sort of um, um, exemplified and that is the of course the, the foundation and then like the enclosure the roof and then like I mean the hearth or the uh, floor so this are, these are some of the aspects that we find that I mean how the architectural spaces he had defined but then he also said that I mean this idea of the enclosure is something that is that was not inherent in all architecture perhaps there can be pillars but it's not really like the idea of the enclosure is something that was there in any of the architectural forms but it might have come from using textiles as tent so for example he would say that I mean the kind of curtains that we use which would separate the outer world from the inner world right like I mean in the interior space from the exterior space so the curtain might become a signifier or like I mean the curtain might become a reminder for us that I mean how an enclosure would be and that might have served 
for a base for understanding how enclosure in the architectural term can come into being the same thing he had said about like the tent structures and then of course like the carpets carpets and curtains are something that i mean he had put much stress into it that i mean how carpet is something that that is there on the floor and it sort of like i mean makes us understand that it, it how this hearth or the floor is something that is an essential part for habitation and why he sort of like i mean understood that there needs to be a correlation between architecture and textiles is because that altogether architecture and textile they can contribute to the understanding of a domestic space or something that we understand as home something that is understand as like a habitable space so he was very much interested in this aspect of human experience and that is the reason he thought that i mean bringing textile and architecture not only as like i mean something that we understand in terms of like i mean just the vertical horizontal structure the technicalities but also through like i mean how we experience these spaces and and then like i mean all those cross referencing between architecture and textiles all those things can come together for us to understand that there are deep interrelation between architecture and textiles so on screen we have an image and that actually is something understood as chic and chick is something which is usually sort of used as a separator in the palace settings it can work as a curtain it can also be like a separator between like the um, um, the the inner quarters the outer quarters and so on and in this one what we have like i mean the bamboo strips are used and on the top of that we have the silk threads the the colored silk threads that that we have here which are sort of like i mean woven into this and that is how like i mean the entire structure is created so it is again a reminder that i mean what all different kind of textiles that we find around us and which can also be incorporated as part of the architecture and that that can contribute to the understanding of um, whether architecture comes from textile or textile comes from architecture again like i mean as as i have mentioned this that we we have like i mean certain forms of architecture and certain forms of textiles which are much more closely interconnected so for example here we have this chhatbandi or this canopy uh, which is a silk velvet canopy that we have with um, embroidered motifs onto it and this is something that we do not really use them in the open spaces but this is very much part of like the stable the architectural structures like i mean this is perhaps like i mean been on the top of some important person if it is about the the king or like i mean the royal members or like i mean the figures of the gods and goddesses that we have and and what kind of like i mean a roof or like an a protected space it might require these are some of the examples that we find and when we sort of connect it to like zemper's uh, work that 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 we find that i mean this this cross references between architecture and textile is not something we can understand in terms of a simple travel of influence from one source to another but we need to understand them much more as a conversation between these two so we will continue this conversation about textile and architecture in the um, uh, next lectures thank you